Hi, Nia. Hey, Alex. Hi, Hi Naomi. Hi, Miranda. <laughs> Hi everyone, if you're just joining us, we're gonna wait for a couple minutes more and then I'll get started with introductions. Okay, I think we're going to get started. I was kind of waiting to see if we could hit 200 before we begin, but I'm sure people will keep logging on. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speakers today. First of all, I wanted to say welcome again to CLAPS. Um, good morning or good afternoon, based on where you're at right now. I'm super excited for this talk today, and our speakers are Jesus Espinosa. He's the Student Success Librarian at the University of Michigan and Naomi Binney, who's the Digital Education Librarian at the University of Michigan. And they're gonna run the session today, but um, I'll be monitoring the chat and doing anything I can to support. Oh, I should also say, sorry, I'm Nia Wallace. I'm a liaison librarian here at the University of Arizona, and I am a member of the CLAPS organizing committee. So, all right, I'll hand it over to you, Naomi and Jesus. Okay, hi everybody. Jesus, can you hear me? Yes. Hello, everyone. Okay. Hey, everybody. Um, yes, we're going to get started. I'm going to switch to our next uh, slide. Hopefully, this works normally. Okay. So, I'm, I'm so, Naomi oh, Benny. 
Go ahead. <laughs> I'm Naomi. I'm the digital education librarian, as was said, um, University of Michigan. Sorry, go ahead, Jesus. Hi, and my name is Jesus Espinoza. My pronouns are he, him, his. I'm the student success librarian at University of Michigan. Um, yeah, so we're going to give you a little bit of context. So uh, the name of the uh, presentation hopefully informed you about what this was about, but we did create um, and yes, Jesus, can you put the link in the chat? Would you mind from the yes. slides? Um, so we are going to talk about using our um, using influencers and social media as a lens for teaching library instruction. So, and this particularly was for um, first year students. So this is a little bit about our context and we're just gonna go ahead and start in on um, what we did, what our process was and what kind of frames we used. So, we are mostly just teaching basic research and library instruction. So this is for, um, again, for first year students. Um, students are usually beginning their research for topical or issues papers. So um, pretty much the first set, first moment that they're stepping into um, the library and usually they're coming in with not a lot of information. Um, so we're gonna share about uh, why we're using influencers and why you're gonna see some sort of reality TV uh, GIFs um, so both of us are big fans of pop culture, some of which um, could be considered trash. Um, we're interested in how it intersects with information literacy and our own like perceptions of reality, um, how it affects how we see uh, what we take in from the internet, what we take in through the news. Um, and obviously information literacy skills are not just applicable for library resources or articles. Students are engaging most students with social media every day. So thinking about um, helping them kind of think about what that means when they're interacting with social media because they are going to do that. Um, and then I took this quote, if anyone watched um, America's Next Top Model, um, especially at the early 2000s, those were the, the golden years. Um, Jay Manuel, I heard recently in an interview say reality TV is the birth mother of social media. So I thought that was like a really smart way to think about um, why we kind of brought all of this together and where we ended up. Um, so the how, our process. Uh, so it started again as an in investigation of information literacy and fame, um, celebrity culture. Both of us are um, big Instagram users and are both millennials and have a lot of interest in all of this stuff. Um, so we are we're thinking we we're thinking about Real Housewives, um, Instagram, YouTube influencers. Um, I personally don't really engage in like the YouTube influencer thing, but there are so many of these, you know, very big makeup tutorials and all these people that are on YouTube um, who really make a whole career out of it and do very well for themselves. And I, it, it feels like a lot of younger uh, folks, students um, are engaging with that. So it seemed like a good thing to think about and to get be engaged with. Um, so we were curious about the following. So we're thinking about intersection of influencers and race. Um, influencers as a filter through which teens, tweens, adults are observing the world, um, thinking a lot about health and wellness because a lot of influencers push various health and wellness, um, you know, products. Um, thinking about influencers as experts um, or actual experts um, and how influencers spread information and misinformation and then how does this affect users. So I'll pass it over to Jesus now. So uh, out of all of these kind of broad topics, we ended up kind of scoping it down to the health and wellness area and specifically health and wellness influencers. We thought this was a really great opportunity to have conversations about who has authority, who has um, credibility in these spaces, who are the voices being heard and followed. Um, and we also wanted to talk about the fact that it is not, a, it is not necessarily a binary of, about whether this entire industry or this entire platform is credible, is not credible, right? There are a lot of doctors and nutritionists who build followings and use these platforms to kind of build their own professional brands, um, just as there are kind of these lifestyle gurus who have maybe a perceived sense of authority in health and wellness, but maybe don't have um, experience or are not pointing to credible sources um, to back up their claims. Next slide. Uh, so that's some of the goals that we wanted to um, 
look to in building this lesson plan and provide the, the, this instruction is to think about deconstructing traditional concepts of authority and expertise. Uh, what are alternate and additional voices that we can include into these conversations? Um, and what perspectives and expertise are they able to bring to these conversations? We also wanted to introduce alternative sources and discuss their value. So certainly things like social media and social media posts, um, having conversations about what value they bring to maybe like an academic or a scholarly conversation and when and where they're appropriate to include those voices and how to contextualize um, those kinds of sources. We also really wanted to include students in the scholarly conversation and especially in the decision making aspects of the scholarly conversation. Um, so wanting to consider and acknowledge different types of expertise um, outside of the traditional concepts of authority and really trying to empower students to give them the, the power to um, decide what voices are important and relevant to bring in uh, into these conversations. And finally, I wanted to acknowledge that maybe not all of us, but certainly a lot of us get information from social media. And that is a certain lens through which we witness and experience the world. Next slide, please. Uh, so in kind of navigating the planning and organizing of this content, we did run into several challenges. The first of which um, is that it became pretty clear early on that our subject matter really does delve into a gray area within health and wellness. And we definitely were not trying to discredit alternative medicine treatments or practices. And we were definitely not intending to provide any type of anything that could be interpreted as medical advice. Um, because health and wellness really are beyond our own personal expertises, we, we knew that we needed to tread carefully in these spaces and how we approached and handled our content. And then in a later slide, we talk about how we consulted with some of our uh, health sciences librarians for some guidance in these areas. Next, we wanted to acknowledge that um, this space of influencers, particularly within health and wellness, does tend to be a female dominated uh, phenomenon or industry, and we wanted to make sure that we were not um, discrediting uh, influencers in this way, um, particularly as it might be rooted in any type of misogyny. Um, so we just definitely had to check ourselves and our assumptions um, and try to remain intentional in keeping the focus on assessing the information that we were presenting uh, in the medium without veering t uh, into discrediting the entire medium or the entire kind of group of um, individuals within this space themselves. Uh, and then finally, this um, search examples ended up being a little bit of a challenge as well. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the specific topic that we ended up choosing, uh, which was the kind of salary juice health trend. Um, so initially, we really wanted to um, find maybe scientific articles that talked about celery juice and this trend to see if we can authenticate or um, discredit the claims being made about celery juice. Um, but we were actually not able to find very many scholarly sources around this topic. We found a lot around celery powder and maybe some benefits around that, but that became, those sources ended up being extremely scientific, very jargony. I couldn't understand a lot of them. Um, so we really had to kind of scope our own process and our own searching to, and our own topic specifically to something maybe a little bit more broad. So instead of just talking specifically about celery juice, talking about health and wellness and nutrition recommendations a little bit more generally. But this also became a really great opportunity to demonstrate this thought process in the lesson plan and talking about how maybe initially we were focused on celery juice, um, but within our first searches, we weren't able to find the amount of information we thought we were. So um, really a great example of how to scope a project either in or out, depending on what you're able to find. Um, so yes, using our celery juice as the example, um, it became a, it, we thought it would be a really good example because it translates well from the social media, um, like fad, uh, into the health and wellness fields and would maybe be a good opportunity for keyword searches. Um, we also were able to um, consult with our health science, exper uh, health science librarians um, to discuss um, the more kind of gray areas around nutrition and health and wellness. Um, so they were really, really great and instrumental in providing some 
um, additional databases that would be really good to recommend it, recommend for students more interested about nutrition um, and really gave us great advice about focusing on the information specifically um, and of course not making any claims ourselves. Um, we also really wanted to incorporate this lesson plan within our evaluating sources activities that we uh, have had within our department. Um, our unit has been currently using an evaluating sources activity that uh, does a really good job of introducing different types of sources. So from a social media post to a scientific article to more popular journals to interviews, things like that. Um, we decided to simplify the activity by having them look at a social media post about celery juice and then applying um, evaluation criteria to an influencer blog post and then an Atlantic article that are on the same topic. Uh, and then we also wanted to incorporate uh, conversations around scholarship as conversation. Um, again, letting them have the power to decide what voices are important to bring in. Um, and also trying to convey the fact that it's not, necessary, it's not necessary to kind of have expertise over a certain area, as long as you are um, doing a great job of consulting different types of sources, um, this, telling the students that they themselves can also speak with authority around their own topics of research. Next slide, please. Okay, so now we are going to actually show our examples of what we did. So for me personally, at least um, when it comes to presentations like this, I just personally really know, want to know what the person did and like what are the practical applications. So that's what we're going to go ahead and do. Um, so actually the next slides you'll see, we first taught this in person um, for probably about a year or so, the fall and spring semesters, uh, so 2019, 2020, um, and then everything went online thanks to this pandemic we're in. Um, so this was is actually going to be a slightly tweaked version that we're showing of what we started using um, when we were teaching online in Zoom, or in my case, when I record a video of myself teaching. Um, so it's a little bit different, but mostly the same content. Um, so just first of all, we just start with this video. I'm not gonna play this video, but um, the links are all on the slides so that you can access them pretty easily. But this is from um, NCSU. It's just a video about uh, what's credible, how to think about credible sources. Um, and then we talk about what social media influencers are. So I found this really interesting with students because um, students typically have a really good handle on what influencers are. And so I always ask them to kind of tell me about it. What do you think uh, that means? Like usually almost every time they'll connect it to the idea of like financial gain because often these influencers are making money off of what they're doing, right? I mean, that's how they make it into a job. Um, but then we're also talking about, again, to, to go back to when Jesus was talking about um, not trying to discredit all social media because there can be like fantastic things on social media. Um, I like to talk about, but a lot of us can see like activism, right? F uh, taking place online in social media. And so, you know, I have these examples of this influencer, Alison Wu or Kylie Jenner, but then also Dr. Darian is like this fantastic um, doctor who is really fantastic to follow and gives a lot of really great information around COVID. So it's a, it's a mix, right? Like social media isn't entirely this terrible um, thing, but it's messy, just like everything else. You know, we all want that black and white answer, but everything really is in this gray area. Um, so next up, this video, um, I highly recommend checking it out. It kind of got squished in this slide, but it's an Instagram health fads from The Atlantic. Um, and we bring this one back in. This is probably like a two to three minute video. And um, it's funny because I personally am not super into like watching quick videos, even though like I know most people love that, but the students like love it. And in class, when you teach it, you see their eyes like just glue onto this and really take it in and listen. So um, basically this video, um, Amanda Mull breaks down um, the celery juice example. So it's really perfect for our lesson plan. Talks about celery juice, um, how there's like no proof that it really has any like value to it other than keeping you hydrated. She talks about where it came from. Um, it all leads back to this medical medium person. I think someone might have put it in the chat. I sort of saw it throw, uh, come through. Um, there's this person who's a medical medium and he says that he is able to sort of like, I don't know, engage with the spirits around your health. And so then he reads you and tells you, you know, you need celery juice. So basically a lot of this came from here. So very interesting, really good video that we have students watch. And then we go into talking about that and talking about sources and like, you know, citing your sources or thinking about where your information is coming from. 
Um, so then we do a source comparison. Um, and we give them these three different sources. Um, one is, I do not believe you, how providing a source corrects health misperceptions across social media platforms. That's our academic article. Um, actually, you can just drink some water from Amanda Mull, who's the same person from the video. It's an Atlantic article, and then an Instagram influencer post. So we discuss them and talk about why you would use them or not and have students, um, you know, in the classroom, we'll have a discussion around it um, online. It's whatever we can kind of think, make work. Um, so I'll pass this to Jesus, I think. Oh, no, I'm sorry, this is still me. Um, so we just kind of, the same thing everyone else does probably when you're talking about evaluating sources is um, going through some questions. What do we talk about? What do we think about when we're um, comparing sources? And now I'll pass to Jesus. Um, yeah, so then with those guiding questions in mind, we then look to each of the individual sources and hope to apply some of that um, criteria and some of those questions to each of those sources. Um, and then we usually will try to point out things to look out for. So the publisher, the authors, what information we're able to find about the authors in each specific case, um, and so on. Um, so again, giving more information, are the authors citing their, their information? Um, where can you find those citations? Things like that. Um, and then we do the same with the other sources. So looking at the type of medium, um, and especially for popular sources, really kind of instilling the fact that a lot of the citations will be found in text and will, there will not necessarily be a bibliography, for example. Um, and then looking at the social media source um, and also pointing out that a lot, of social media a lot of social media posts that make claims will often have sources, right? So uh, the importance of investigating sources. Um, this uh, influencer post, for example, does have a citation to the medical medium uh, post or it does tag the medical medium website. Um, so really investigating those sources um, to make sure that if something is being cited that you can actually investigate that source and see if you find it credible or not. And then finally we have a larger conversation about whether or not each of these sources are appropriate to use and how you would use them. I think initially we try to frame it, we try to fake them into doing like a little binary kind of thing where they have to choose, oh, this source is definitely appropriate, this source is not appropriate. And then having a conversation about, um, having a conversation maybe in a more nuanced aspect that all of these sources can be used. It just depends on how you wanna use them, how you contextualize them. Some of them might require a little bit more contextualizing and maybe um, explaining maybe some of the limitations in the point of view or bias presented. Yeah, and then just to wrap it up real quick, um, we also just use this opportunity to make it uh, talking about search plan and search strategies. Um, so we talk about keywords with students and um, it's just a nice way to sort of connect everything. So we're doing the evaluating sources, but then we also kind of bring it into a search plan, um, talking about having students think about the ideas and concepts with us, come up with new keywords and think about what kind of viral misinformation is out there, um, especially around celebrities and social media. Um, and then I'm just gonna quit pass through this pretty quickly, but you know, the typical telling students um, where to find things, how to work through the you know, library website and all that. And I thought it'd be good to share this. Again, we'll share the slides again through the link, but um, it, it, you know, anyone's welcome to like use this kind of workflow or slides if it if it helps you. Um, so pointing students to databases and we normally go through a database practice and the student will do a demo and you know we have a lot of discussion based um, work through this. Okay so but uh, in practice um, we felt that we did get good responses from students. Um, we had a lot of questions and it felt that we were, students were getting more critical and thoughtful about what they were exposed to. Um, and also helping students think about the fact that you can write about honestly anything and especially it helps if you're interested in it, right? And a lot of students, of course, are engaging in social media and seeing things on Instagram or seeing things on Twitter or YouTube. And someone might really think a lot about like makeup tutorials on YouTube, but not think that there's, you know, that that's an appropriate topic for a paper. It's not academic enough or it's not, you know, it's maybe too like feminine or something, but having students, real, showing students that they can, whatever they are interested in, they can write about that. It's like it's you're trying to empower them basically through this. I think it's been pretty effective and pretty um, successful. Um, and so 
really good lively discussions. It's gone really well. And then we started planning for influencer lesson 2.0, which I will point uh, to Jesus for that. Unmuting. Uh, based on the response and the relative kind of success that we felt that the lesson plan had, we wanted to explore some of these topics further. Um, so we started developing a lesson plan 2.0. Um, and this one would be uh, online, so in the form of modules. And then some of the things we wanted to focus on, oh, sorry, next slide, please. And some of the things we want to focus on this time is a food Instagram. Um, both Naomi and myself are super interested in food and food culture, um, and we um, may have evidence of that later on in the slides. Um, we wanted to use the social media post from something that we consider to be a little bit more credible um, and really going through the process of how do you evaluate whether that is credible. Um, and then also dealing with anti-racist medical and cultural content. Um, so finding a topic that could, uh, we could introduce some of these lenses to as well. Um, so this resulted in our, oh, sorry, next slide. <laughs> This resulted in our um, online module that we are currently very, very, very close to finishing up. Um, and I will let Naomi take the next slide. Um, yes. So this is where we kind of were looking around online and sort of trying to, we just, we knew we were coming up with a, a kind of 2.0 version. Also, I'll say, hey, Susan, I really wanted to make this as critical as we could and wanted it just it felt like we wanted to take more of a have more of a of a of a, of a possibility to make more of a clear message or statement or be more clearly anti-racist what we were doing so that was something that we both really cared about um so i followed this person um on instagram noodle phd um i did ask her for permission to use this use her post and to involve her in this and she was pretty excited about it um so she posted this um instagram it says i i have there's a link there again so you can get to this if you want to see it but basically is like there is a widespread stereotype or bias against msg right that it's like bad for your body and that it causes all these problems um but a lot of that is unfounded especially scientifically unfounded and um comes from some just old racist uh, belief systems that have just, of course, continued along with us. So it's a really great post about that. And I thought this could be a really interesting opportunity to take this and build on it and have a different version of a social media um, discussion around MSG and um, whether or not this is like an, a, a sound uh, thing to believe in or not. So. Um, we have this in, in modules, and so we don't, we're not showing the Canvas modules exactly, but um, basically, especially now that we're gonna be fully online, for the most part, our library instruction is all online right now. Um, this will be one of the modules that's available to students. And for the most part, we're expecting um, first years to use this, but this could be used for anyone. Um, so we talk through how to discover it, who the person is that you're following on Instagram um, when you're looking at social media. So Noodle PhD, she shares her YouTube account. Um, she has that PhD in there, so we assume she's probably a graduate student, but we don't actually know right until we start going deeper. Um, and so we go into her YouTube. Her YouTube shares her website. On her website, you can see her CV. She's um, a PhD student studying neurobiology. Um, she really knows what she's talking about. She has done lots of research. And she's also an artist. She's a very, really cool, uh, friendly, helpful person. So um, we kind of help students thinking to think about digging deeper into the social media. Um, and so kind of similar to uh, what we did before of having students engage with various sources. So next we have them um, looking at an article we found on PubMed. And we make sure it's an article that students don't have to sign in to access. Um, just to make it easier. So there are, this is, it's very different than the salary in that you can find tons and tons of research on MSG or monosodium glutamate and find out that it does not affect brain function and that it, that is just like a widespread um, incorrect assumption. Um, but it is, it is basically a, a culturally held belief within a lot of the Western world, I would say, but it, ha it doesn't hold up at all. So having students think about looking at this article, why does this article to you look um, to be trustworthy, the whole same process that we did before. Um, and then I'll let Jesus take the next one. Yeah, and it was definitely important to uh, make sure that we went through the same process that we did for the social media post as we did with all of these articles. 
Um, we also wanted to add a little bit more of a nuance when we're talking about academic articles and peer-reviewed articles, so really talking about the difference between, for example, a scientific peer-reviewed article and then more of a humanities or an interdisciplinary peer-reviewed articles. What are some of the differences? Um, and even in the structures, um, with this one, there's not necessarily a bibliography section, but there's a notes, which includes all of the citations as well as additional notes that the author made. Um, so really going through the structure and trying to um, impart some type of knowledge to the students that as you run across these different types of sources, there are going to be a lot of different ways that these articles are structured. Um, so you're going to have to do a little bit more digging for some of them to find the sources, even if they are academic sources. Um, and then especially if they're not academic sources, you might have to do a little bit more investigation. Uh, next slide, please. And then also including popular articles. Um, this one also at first was a little bit of a challenge because since it's, it's, since it's an older article, none of the citations are actually linked. So you, I think it like makes mention of the sources, but there's no link to get them directly. So this could also become a nice like conversation starter about um, having to do a little bit more work to find the sources that are being cited or the sources that are being referenced. Um, and again, just generally having a good variety of different types of sources um, that the students might come across in doing the research. And then I think throughout we wanted to um, uh, talk about the process of maybe seeing something on Instagram, having that pique your interest, um, and that can totally be a valid research topic. Um, and then how do you tra transition from looking at those types of sources into doing this similar type of search within maybe our databases or our library um, catalog. Um, and then finally in conclusion, oh, sorry, next slide, <laughs> I keep forgetting. Uh, then finally in conclusion, um, we definitely learned the process of incorporating influencer content into our lesson plans resulted in increased classroom engagement. Um, we really hope that it was able to empower students to engage with scholarship and to empower them to really see their point of view as um, as important in having a deciding factor in uh, choosing what sources to incorporate, what voices to incorporate. One question we always ask is um, if there are voices or narratives that you think are um, relevant or important in this conversation and maybe you're not seeing them in the scholarly journals or in the databases that you're searching, what are other alternate ways to include some of these voices, right? So looking at um, interviews, looking at oral histories, um, there's so much out there. Um, so it, it is important that if you do see a gap in voices being included, um, figuring out maybe ways to fill those gaps. Um, our discomfort with navigating these conversations around health and wellness ended up also being a really great opportunity um, to talk about and maybe dismantle our own concepts of authority within the classroom. Um, we were able to have conversations about a lot of the great areas that um, come from assessing concepts like authority, reliability, trustworthiness within information sources. Um, and it also just became a great opportunity for us to have those discussions um, in terms of our online and in-person classes um, prior to the modules. And then we also found that some of these topics would be very rich to explore within a module context um, and hoping that well, we haven't sent them out yet, but we're hoping that we'll get some feedback as well on what um, students felt about them. Uh, and then if I missed anything, feel free to add, Naomi. Yeah, um, I know there's a lot of questions coming through, so and it's very difficult to do so many things at once. So we'll take a look at those in a bit. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's been really, really interesting to see how students have reacted and um, uh, I think, you know, we're never going to be exactly on their level because we are not their same age as much as Jesus and I think sometimes that we are, we're not. <laughs> and, you know, we're on Instagram, but we're like seeing different things from our demographic and, um, you know, our president is on Twitter all the time and so much is happening on social media, activism is happening through social media. And I think there's a lot of there's something deeper, of course, after this. This is like a really good first step for having freshmen or first year writing students work through and deal with these kind of questions. But then there's this whole other layer that Jesus and I think have been interested in getting into of like, how does this connect to like our political sphere and the fact that we have a reality TV president, which is happening, you know, how do all those things connect and how do we, and right now we're all seeing each other through screens. So we are even more so just 
during seeing everything through these various lenses. So there's a lot of interesting things I think to to take uh, to go forward from this. Um, I did want to show um, an, an acknowledgments page because we did get a lot of really helpful feedback from folks. Um, we have our own uh, department. Shayla Garcia is no longer with us. She's at GVSU, but we she helped us a lot at the time. Um, we have our health sciences uh, librarians um, and also Kelly Malefki, who's from a different health sciences library at UNM, and Gina Levitan, who is a big a uh, fan of Housewives and reality TV and helped us think a lot about like where we wanted to go with this. Um, so yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Um, Jesus and I do have um, cooking Instagrams if you want to follow us. We thought it was probably appropriate to share them. Um, <laughs> so we shared our Twitters and our Instagram um, uh, accounts here that folks are welcome to share to look at. And yes, yeah, so I can't, I, I'm seeing, sort of looking at the chat now, I see one Housewives of New Jersey. I'm, I appreciate that someone else is watching Housewives and doesn't think this is just terrible. Um, but uh, our next slide is just for questions. I'm a little concerned that it is going to stress people's brains out. So, because there's four GIFs on it, GIFs, sorry. Um, so I'll leave this on for a moment and then I'll switch back to the previous. But um, yeah, opening up for questions. I love Potomac. <laughs> love Potomac. Number one show. If you're going to watch any Housewives, really? watch Potomac. It's art. <laughs> um, I don't know, Neve. should we, is there a, a, a way that we're doing questions? Sure. I mean, I can, do you want me to read from them from the chat or do you guys want to handle or? If, so if they're in the chat, we can read through them or if someone wants to um, turn on their mic, that's fine too. Um, okay. I might just look at, I know that I feel like there was a question somewhere that was just asking who this was for. So just to reiterate, this was for, um, we taught uh, first year students. Um, so mostly just students on their first beginnings of writing papers. Um, I'm seeing a question, did you find that students already knew they would question health influencers credibility or were they taking it as fact? Jesus, do you wanna speak to that? Um, yeah, I think initially they were all very skeptical of any type of social media source. Um, so it, it ended up being us almost arguing a little bit for those types of sources um, and explaining that, you know, there are a lot of um, credible figures, doctors, nutritionists, etc., who are maybe giving good advice and good recommendations um, on social media. And it really just became a matter of how those sources are contextualized. Are they pointing to the sources? Um, a lot of doctors, especially on social media, will point to the studies that they're citing. Um, but yeah, we did we, initially. We did definitely find them to uh, always kind of credit, uh, attribute the least amount of credibility to the social media sources, especially when comparing them with other sources. Yeah, and I'm also seeing um, a question or two, I think, from Megan about um, colonizers. Um, making it a, a crime to practice holistic medicine, discrediting, um, like for example, Ayurveda, and then another question around um, capitalism, right? So those are all like major reasons why we talk to health sciences librarians, because we, I don't have any training in like thinking about all of those things. It was really helpful to talk to others about it. But that was a big concern is that we didn't want to discredit that kind of um, treatment or that kind of health. So it, it sometimes would make me nervous because I didn't, I don't want to make it sound as if I am discrediting folks like that or, you know, any kind of like non-Western traditional medicine. Um, so that was a concern for me. Um, and, but we are thinking also to also reiterate this, it's, we have very short period of time with them, right? These are freshmen that are usually like, we're seeing them very early on in their classes. So it's kind of like thinking about how much time do I have to talk about what I'm talking about? And we do, I think both Jesus and I try to get to get to quick, quick mentions of around capitalism, around non-Western medicine while we're doing this, but you know, we are somewhat limited and also trying not to overwhelm them so that they can't hear or learn anything. So it's kind of like a balance. I don't know if you want to add to that, Jesus. Um, yeah, I agree. <laughs> um, <laughs> One of the other questions is how many sessions did we get to do with the students? I would say between, uh, I guess we started really doing it uh, fall 2018, 2019 into 2020. So I would say for myself, probably between 25 and maybe 35 sessions I did this in total. 
Yeah, and I'm not sure if the question is like with one class, we're only getting mm. this is for one shot. It is a one shot type yeah, it's one shot. Of, of class. So it's just the one time. Um, so we're only we only have that small period of time to to reach with reach students, if that was part of the question. Um, someone's asking if we talked about the number of likes or shares might make something more credible. Yes, that, that is something we would usually talk about with the influencers is um, you know, it's difficult to say if if someone has like 500 likes, 500,000 likes, definitely doesn't necessarily mean it's credible at all, right? But that more people are engaging with it. So I would say usually students, as Jesus said, are already pretty skeptical of influencers and not necessarily willing to believe in these things just because there's likes, but that's also University of Michigan uh, freshman students. Like that doesn't necessarily represent all students or all people everywhere. So I think that's maybe just reflective of them. Um, someone saying, do you cover anything else in this one shot or just this lesson? Jesus? Um, so for myself, I kind of incorporated this topic into all aspects of the lesson. So most of what you saw in the lesson plan is what is included. And then at the end, we do do a database searching exercise um, where we have the students um, go into some of our databases, give them a few minutes to search, and then we have a couple of them come up and demonstrate their search, um, talk about what strategy they used, and if there's any specific tools within the database that they found useful or maybe frustrating. Um, and then early on, we also have a pretty free conversation um, where the students can volunteer um, different criteria that they use for evaluating sources. So they'll mention things like um, looking at who the author is, where something is published, looking for signs of bias. Um, and then they talk a lot about the dot G, dot com versus dot edu dot org dot gov. So we talk a lot about that in that section as well. Yeah, um, I'm also seeing um, where was this? Does anyone else get pushback when using New York Times as a sample source? Um, I I do think it depends on the class. I feel like some students are are like we love New York Times and we think it's great, and then other students say it's like liberal bias. Right? So you know, I think we we probably in this in this especially in this university have a wide range of like it leans left and liberal maybe, but also students are coming from everywhere and coming from rural Michigan as well. And so it, there's a whole bundle of different types of stereotypes around that, I think. Jesus, I don't know if you have anything. Right. In the module, we do make sure to kind of contextualize that a little bit by talking about the New York Times as a publication and then investigating maybe where within the Times it's published, looking at the difference between something that's like an opinion or an op-ed editorial versus something that's actual reporting. Um, and then just investigating a little bit into the specific journalists, seeing what, um, if they have a track record or what history they have um, uh, of their publications, what other articles have they written in the past, et cetera. I don't know if there's any other questions. Did I'm, anyone I'm else? moving up to see if there's anything. Okay. I appreciate everyone adding different um, thoughts and you know, adding to our ideas. Any pushback pr from professors on looking at social media? Uh, no. Yeah, no, not not so far in my experience. In my experience, it's only been really positive um, feedback. And, you know, it also maybe speaks to like our, a lot of who we're teaching for, which is maybe important to add. These, these uh, first year students often have a PhD student teaching them. So they're, they're called GSIs, like they're graduate student teachers. And so often those teachers are um, very fun to work with and are like usually very interested in social justice and really do push their students and put a lot of like critical thinking in front of them. Um, so they're usually like they'll they'll even push students even farther than we will as well. So I, I find that um, professors or instructors are usually really on board with us. I don't know if you think the same, Jesus. Yes, and then we also have the opportunity to uh, do a little bit of this lesson plan with our CSP Bridge students over the summer. Um, and the reception has been very positive from the instructors there as well. Um, I did find another question. Um, have you done any preparation to support students who may be impacted as being very invested in these wellness related fads, particularly students who may be struggling with either food scarcity or disordered eating? Um, I wish I could read that because I kind of need to read it to understand the full question. Um, I think we, we definitely, I would say that the video itself, the Atlantic one um, about celery juice does talk about how um, reliance on information like this is not actually helping with 
uh, people who are in food deserts or who are experiencing food scarcity and that, you know, pushing things like, you know, a $10 bottle of celery juice is not actually like helping anyone when it comes to those issues. Um, but typically, we don't necessarily tell students like, those, these people are all wrong or these people are all right. It's more like this is, you know, this is the context and this is what you're, what you're working through and what you're looking at. I don't know if Hayes used to be anything to add. Yeah, I would just say that it's something that I personally have to do a little bit more um, thought and preparation around, um, but I'm very uh, glad that you brought it up. Yeah. Um, there's another question from Adriana. The entire concept and commonality of link in bio could be a conversation about citation and social media as well. Was this something that students connected as valuable for credibility? I think that's really interesting. Um, yeah, we, I, I, I guess we just like missed, we didn't talk much about the link in bio kind of trend, um, but we did try to focus on uh, sources that did, whether we felt that they were credible or not, that they did link to other sources or like tag whoever they were um, uh, giving credit to some of these claims. Um, so we found that to be really good conversation around um, just because somebody has citations doesn't necessarily mean that those citations are credible or trustworthy. So really investigating um, where somebody is pointing you to. Yeah, and I'm seeing people mentioning the swipe up feature in Instagram stories. Yeah, it's really a form. But right, what Rachel is saying, you have to have 10,000 followers to even mm -hmm. have a swipe up feature. So then you can only cite if you have enough power or you've purchased enough, um, you know, followers. Yes, Miranda, I cannot use a swipe up and neither can you. I mean, maybe you can. I know Miranda, so it's not rude. Um, <laughs> um, someone mentioned season two of the podcast. The dream examines health fad claims as well. Yes, um, very interesting. It's really helpful for this for thinking about this. Um, and I'm thinking about also with uh, oh, what was that? Um, I'm thinking also with citations um, that um, I'm sorry, I just lost my train of thought because I heard some kind of noise. Um, here's another question. I've seen it now. I've seen influencers who have a lot of scholarly citations, but they may be cherry picked or low evidence. So even more critical thinking needed. Yeah, for sure. Oh, I know what I was going to say. In the um, MSG post, so that person who posted that, she really knows what she's talking about and has a lot of um, ton to share and knows what she's talking about, but she actually doesn't put citations in her post. So you can tell that she knows what she's talking about and you can go into her whole CV, but unfortunately she does not actually cite the papers um, or you know citations within her post. So that is something to be considered is um, it seems really great, but also you would still need to do your own fact checking of that social media post. Looking and seeing what else we have. Yes, citing stories in, in, uh, in a paper. I don't know about that. That sounds difficult. <laughs> um, if we missed any questions, please um, feel free to resend them um, and apologies for anything that we miss. Yes. I see one here and you guys, you may have answered this already, but did you talk about transitioning this to an online like live streaming Zoom session format? Um, well, we've done it for classes. I don't know if it, if, if the person is referring to like outside of class. Is that what we think? Um, yeah. I think it, no, I think it was referring to this semester when most, a lot oh. of us are doing teaching remotely. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I taught this um, for online. So the first version, the celery juice version was a remote, yes, a remote one shot. So, um, and then in other t cases, when I recorded myself, um, I was like a 30 minute Zoom and I, I edited it so it was nice and compact, but I taught the same uh, content, but put it in video in a video form. And I think I sent it to like eight different classes in the spring. And then I'm assuming the same thing will happen this semester. We'll see what instructors are wanting if they want remote. Um, we have been trying to stay away from remote so that students who like can't so easily log on and use Zoom in our different time zones, we don't want to make it more difficult for them. So we are trying to more push asynchronous work. Um, and so the MSG um, and anti-racism modules, those are fully asynchronous online. And so in that case, you know, not to get too in the weeds, but they are going to be on Canvas. So that's our LMS at our library or at our university. And so we have the ability to have um, instructors bring those Canvas modules in, um, which actually makes it easier because we have 
a, a, an incredible amount of students that we need to serve and we can't serve them entirely. Um, a question from Killeen. Um, it's great that you're helping students discern how to evaluate all these different types of sources in health sciences. So many people are not represented in the academic and medical literature, and I often teach that going on Reddit and Instagram can be a good way to get personal stories and then find EBM sources to help make appropriate connections. Have you found that this helps students trust their own voices and understand what voices are being left out of the conversation? That's an interesting question. Jesus, do you want to address it? Yeah, I think that's something um, that I don't go into enough, but we definitely have conversations um, around uh, specific within our specific topic. And I think we did this with our prior um, topics as well, thinking about what um, voices or perspectives and asking them like what additional voices do you think maybe aren't included um, or um, referenced in some of the sources that we're looking at. And then just a, a little bit, unfortunately, we have a lot of like time limitations, but in, uh, within a one shot, but a little bit of um, how to find some of these alternate sources um, and what the value of like an interview might be um, to contextualize or strengthen the argument you might be making based on the, um, whether it's a scientific article or the more academic types of sources. Yeah, and I'll just add, I know we're kind of running low on time, but that um, previous to this version, um, I, we kind of mentioned how we would do a um, evaluating sources of four different sources. So, and that was around the Flint water crisis. Um, and through that, we included social media and we also included an interview with a water activist. So, and that was really helpful to have to constantly talk with students about, okay, so this person is not um, a scientific uh, article writer, right? But like, it's still someone that we really need to listen to because they have firsthand experience of, of water affecting their health in this area. So um, I think it's something that we're always thinking about. And um, I really appreciate you bringing that up, Killeen. Um, and I, again, I think like Jesus has been saying, we really do, for both of us, our, our big interest is like empowering students because you see how anxious students can be in the first year and don't trust themselves or anything that they think or anything that they're interested in. Um, and I personally was not like an A plus student who just like loved all of school. I know some librarians, that's like their story, but it's not my story. Um, so it's really helpful when I know that if someone had told me, oh, you're interested in like weird MTV next reality TV culture, you can write about that. I would have really benefited from that because I could have done all the writing on that. Um, so anyway, I just find it really helpful to always talk about their voices being important. And uh, for some of the longer sessions, if we do have time, we do just make, let, let time for some like directed research and we'll walk around the room yeah. and try to check in with each student individually. And that has been a really great source of conversation and just knowing like what topics interest them and, um, you know, asking some questions about um, that will help them maybe um, scope down their topic if it's something very broad, um, but really letting them pursue the interest that they feel is something that they're passionate about. Um, I think I just want to also mention that someone was asking about the chat transcript. And as far as I understand, you can download it yourself. If you click the little dot, dot, dot next to where you can just type in a message and then you can save the chat there. Um, uh, Amy says, the day I discovered fan studies as an academic area of study changed my entire perspective on academia. Yeah, I think Jesus and I would have loved to have been more aware of that when we were 18 um, because big feelings about that. Um, my senior year, I wrote a term paper on Heidi Montag, and that was like truly like my peak in college. Okay, so then you were on top of it. I did. I still didn't know I could be academic about the hills. Um, there's a question regarding not immediately discrediting influencers. How would a one shot like this address information provided by health influencers that can actually be dangerous, like activated charcoal drinks and medication reactions? Oh yeah, I mean, there's just so many other areas that you could go in, and so I. I welcome everybody to, to get into that. We do normally really quickly when we're talking about what influencers are and what like health influencers are is typically talk about like, have you heard of the sugar bear hair um, product gummies that the Kardashians are always pushing. Also the Kardashians were at one point pushing this lollipop that is supposed to suppress your appetite. And you know, it was being sort of like advertised towards like younger female audiences and like that's super problematic. So um, there's, a million ways to go with this. Um, so we fell into the kind of crevices that we did, but I feel like there's so many more interesting ways. Um, 
It's, it's, I, it can be, it's not simple though. Go ahead, Jesus. Oh, I really like that the Atlantic video does acknowledge that a little bit. It talks about that the celery juice trend is relatively harmless. You're just ingesting water when you think you're ingesting things that are more beneficial, but with other fads, it could be something that's maybe dangerous. Yeah. Um, oh, there's a comment about using Medline Plus. Um, I think when we spoke to the health science informationist at our library, they did mention, they did show us uh, Medline Plus and we looked up salary and there was nothing there. So, you know, um, we were trying to think about incorporating that into the lesson plan, but there's really nothing to say <laughs> other than it's not there. <laughs> Let's see if there's anything else. Thanks everyone for being so um, interactive on the chat. I'm sorry I was unable to really look at it in the beginning because I it was just there's was just so much going on, but I appreciate it. Um, we have our information there. We didn't think to share our emails because we went with social media instead. Um, but you can absolutely um, DM us on Twitter or follow our our food <laughs> Instagrams if you're so inclined. Um, I'm going to keep looking to see if there's any more questions. I'm going to add my email to the chat. I think there, I saw a question about um, if this is available. I don't know if you answered if this is available on uh, Canvas Commons. Oh, yeah. Oh, thank you. So, yes, this will be on Canvas Commons. And so that's only useful to those of you who have Canvas and who also, um, like, your institution subscribes to Canvas. So if there is interest, I think we're, we, we can totally make this available in a different form, probably, through, like, Google. Google website, Google, something like that, Google sites maybe. So we'll, we can look into that. And if people are, are interested, that's great. I think it should go on Canvas Commons within the week probably. Um, so it'll for sure be available there, but if others want to see it and everything else, um, I think it's pretty easy to put on Google sites. Yeah, so if people are saying, I don't have Canvas, I'd love to have access, then we can do that. And I'll, we can talk to the Collapse administrators to talk about maybe if it's in slides, if there's a way to, to make it more available, but I will look into that for sure. Thank you so much for asking about that. Just reading through more comments. Thanks everyone for coming, really appreciate yes, thank it. Thank you so much. It's hard to do anything right now during this pandemic with your um, usual job <laughs> of expectations. So um, thank you so much for coming and for, for giving us of any awkwardness. And I'll just say thank you to Jesus and Naomi for a wonderful presentation, echoing all the chats coming in right now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yes, I should stop recording.